Okay, so we're here to talk about mental health. And just so you know, I'm not here to diagnose or to treat, nothing like that. I just wanted to clear the ear or just to bring it to the forefront a little bit. Because as you know, mental health has been that stepchild, right? It was never sitting at the dining room table. It was everything else. When I decided to do this, which I will tell you more about, you know, most of my friends were like, Juliet, why are you, cho why are you choosing psychiatry, right? All my friends as nurses were always going into like neurology or med surge. It was always a part of nursing that you think, you know, you go to nursing school, that's what you do. I have always been infatuated with the brain. That's just me. So I chose something that would allow me to study the brain. Well, here goes. Something showed up that has now brought the brain to the forefront, right? Mental health, psychiatry. So now I feel like there is finally a place for us. So we're going to be sitting at the table because mental health needs to be addressed. COVID kind of now decided to show up unpredictable, you know, with mental health. So many things will show up, which you never expected. But well, COVID did that for us. So, here goes. We are now going to talk about mental health. And the topic I chose today is mental health matters. We here at the Apopka Church, we care. We are not just a building. If you notice, there's a beautiful building going up back there. And we have to fill it with people, not programs. We need to be of service to the community. And I just want to thank Maynard for inviting me to be a part of the TCI initiative. What is that? It is total community involvement. It is where we are now going to be the pulse of the community. In other words, we are going to offer services, not programs. The last thing a church needs, programs. We need to serve. My, in my capacity as a mental health provider, is going to be of service. Service to my fellow brothers and sisters here in church and the community. Let's get started. Slide one. Okay, what is the goal for this evening? I think I may have mentioned that I'm not here to diagnose, treat, or anything like that. I just wanna give you the bare facts. I'm gonna keep it very simple as well because there are some parts of this that is so scientific but that's not why, what we're doing here. First, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about me. I think it's kind of important. Is there anyone here who likes to talk about themselves? Raise your hand. <laughs> All right, so you know how hard that is gonna be for me, right? <laughs> I'm gonna tell you about some causation factors and as a result of some stuff, what happens, right? Which are the results. I am also going to tell you where do you begin from now, moving forward. I'm going to also explain something which I find is very, kind of very tricky and challenging out there in the community. The numerous numbers of specialties and people and what they do, I want you to have a good understanding so you can become more empowered to make a choice. I wanna tell you about the goals that we have here under the TCI initiative, right? What are we going to do about what we talk about? How do we put our how do we apply this information? And what are we intending to do for you and for all of us? And then I'm also going to introduce you to resources that are in the community. I do not want you to keep this information to yourself. Go tell somebody else. Pull some alo someone along with you. And that's where we're going to go tonight. So welcome aboard. Let's begin. About me. I am a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. What does that mean? I went to school to become a nurse. I completed adva an advanced degree. And in addition to that, I returned to school to become a psychiatrist added to my nursing role. Hence, a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. I am like a psychiatrist and I am a nurse. So you put those together, that's what I do. 
I do what the psychiatrist does, but I also do nursing stuff too. So you get two for one. <laughs> Is that helpful? Okay. <laughs> now, I've worked many years in nursing. In my role, I've always loved community health. I have never enjoyed being in the hospital, right? Never, it, I felt very confined because what happens when I meet you at the bedside? I want to know what happens when you leave. How can I support you? I felt like I wanted to be more supportive in the community because you know what? In the hospital, you have so many people who can help you. But when you leave, what happens, right? So I decided to work in community health as a visiting nurse. I worked in home health and hospice. Very challenging area of nursing, but I loved it. I worked in also medical surgical nursing. I worked, in, which means you come in for surgery, I'm here for you. If you need help at the bedside, I'm here for you. I work in psychiatry, that's what I do now. And I work in community health. I lived in New Jersey most of my life. I recently moved here only three years ago. Now, when I was in New Jersey, I was voted by the, well, I don't like to talk about it too much, but the March of Dimes decided that because of my in involvement in the community, I was voted nurse of the year. So my heart is here. It's in the community of Apopka. It's here at church. I combine both, community and church. I was born in Jamaica. Why do you need to know this? Because sometimes my accent gets in the way. <laughs> you will hear me say words sometimes that you may have to like listen twice, right? But I also believe that there's a cultural component to care. And I must be very careful that you understand that I do come to the table with life experiences from my culture and from the community in which I live. I am also, which I think is very important for us as Seventh-day Adventists, I am also a member of the National Holistic of Nursing Society. I incorporate nursing, holistic nursing, and psychiatry in my practice. So I am a holistic practitioner. Now, I also own, recently, a, a mental health private practice. What does that mean? I do not work in the hospital. And I previously worked for a small practice, but I decided that I was a little bit limited with my practice. I wanted to practice holistically as well. But as you know, the state doesn't allow you to incorporate lifestyle, exercise, nutrition, diet, all that good stuff, which you are all day long. You're not just a pill, you are a person. So I have to consider your culture, what you do, who do you live with, where do you live, right? It is called functional integrative medicine, and that is my model. I am able to do this in my own practice. No one dictates to me anymore, right? <laughs> as long as I follow the legal guidelines of my practice, which is dictated by the state of Florida, it's federal, right? And it's by the nursing board. So I am able to manage what I do all day long. In addition to that, I treat clients from 12 years and older. So from 12 years old until whatever the number is, right? I can see you. I offer access to care. What does that mean? You will never have to leave the comforts of your home, your kitchen, your classroom, the college campus, you just have to get that link, and I'll see you right there. We can talk. I'll see you for the first hour for the initial visit. We talk about all kinds of things. I ask about mom, dad, grandparents, friends, all that good stuff, right? That is called telehealth. It is the new way now. COVID has really caused us to look at so many things differently. So going to the doctor's office might not be very convenient for most, but I am so happy that now I can see those who are homebound, those who have challenges with going somewhere. 
So this is me, a little of me. What is a mental health? We hear this all day long. Mental health, mental illness, all kinds of mental words, right? And I'm gonna to try to clarify a few of those. Let's just look at this definition. According to the Center for Disease, cdc.gov, right? Mental health is an important part of overall health and well-being. Mental health includes our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It affects how we think, how we feel, and how we act. It also helps determine how we handle stress, how we relate to other people, and how we are able to make healthy choices. Mental health is important at every stage of life, from childhood and adolescence through adulthood. I wanted to remember this. Poor mental health is not the same as mental illness. Okay, remember this. There is such a thing as poor mental health and there is such a thing as mental illness. Well, what is the difference? You can be mentally ill, but you're not experiencing poor health. So there is mental illness, but there's no hypertension, there's no diabetes, right? There's no other what we call pre-existing condition. You're overall a healthy person. There is just a mental illness. You can also have mental illness, well, like I said, mental illness, and then poor mental health. You can have poor mental health, but you're not mentally ill. So there is a difference there, okay? Let me tell you about the prevalence of mental illness. We're not talking about poor mental health here. We're talking about mental illness. 50% of individuals will be diagnosed with mental illness throughout their lifetime. Remember we talked about from childhood to adulthood? 50%. Now, mental illness is also diagnosed at varying degrees, okay? Mild, moderate, and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, that's 50%. Talk about prevalence, it's all over the place. One in five, look at the number, children. One in five will experience a mental illness in a given year. Well, we don't have to look far, COVID. COVID showed up, unpredictable. It's usually the unpredictables that causes us to go. One in five ch child ch children currently or at some point during their life have had a serious debilitating mental illness. One in 25 Americans live with a serious mental illness such as, just to throw a diagnosis out there, right? Schizophrenia, bipolar disorder or major depression. I just wanted to add a little bit to that we mentioned this morning, Pastor James, anxiety. Anxiety prevails. Next slide, please. In 2020, year of COVID, an estimated 52.9 million adults ages 18 or older was diagnosed with some form of a mental illness. It is higher among Females, women, 25.8%, 15.8% males. The highest prevalence of mental illness, young adults, 18 to 25 years old. So what the problem is right now, they're in college, they just started a career, they're just starting to date, right? Compare that to adults 26 to 49 years old, which we have a statistic of 25.3% and 50% of 
14.5 of adults older than 50. That is when you're kind of at your peak, sorta. You're working, you're settled, you bought your house already, you're still helping to raise your kids, right? When you take, when you take a look at the ages, you recognize that those who need our help most are from 18 years old to 25 years old, that is a critical time for all of us. That is what we're seeing. That is what I see all day long. And it is very, very challenging. Hence, we can't just tell our kids to snap out of it, right? We just can't. Next slide. I'm going to dispel a myth right now that mental illness is caused by any one thing. Not true. There are many factors that contribute to mental health and mental illness. It is a convergence of sometimes all of them at the same time, not just one. So we are unable to treat this in isolation. Biological, psychological, and environmental. Tonight, I'm just going to address Maybe just three. Next slide, please. Let us take a look at biological. I'm not going to get too much into science, like I mentioned, but I will just be an oversight. Neurochemical balance, and I'm going to explain a little bit of each. Genetics, infections. Who knew that infections could cause some mental illness, right? Brain defects or injury, prenatal damage, Substance abuse, poor nutrition, or exposure to toxins. That is the scope of some of the factors relating to the biological implications of mental illness. Let's just go to the next slide. I want to talk about neurochemical imbalance for a little bit. But I'm going to explain a little bit by using a little bit of something. Let's just do it. All right. When you see this, what do you think about? Sour. sour? And what does sour mean for you? Unpleasant taste, right? Do you notice that there's, if you were to lick a lemon, what do you think would happen here? Like, wh what do you think happened? Can I, can I borrow you for a little bit? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I'm sorry about the impromptu. <laughs> right? What happens when you look, without touching, what, what happens when you think of licking a lemon? Like, um, like it's um, sour and like sweet at the same time, I guess. Yeah. It's like a yeah. Yeah. And so is that a pleasant taste? Is it? It's not bad, but like if you get too much of it, it's like. It, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> mouth, right? It's waters, yeah. right? Yeah. It, okay. All right. So this is a lemon. Universally, we all know that the lemon is very sour, right? What happens when you, but uh, the thing is with a lemon, what you see is sour or unpleasant tasted, correct? But do you ever think about the benefits of something that is so unpleasant, but yet it has so many benefits, health benefits? Is that the first thing that comes to your mind? <laughs> no. No? <laughs> Not, right? No one well, if you were to hold this lemon, would it change the way you now think about a lemon? The fact that you're holding it in your hand and it's perhaps not... Real. <laughs> it's not real. <laughs> <laughs> I really do like lemon. Why? <laughs> yeah. So, well, thank you so much. Yeah, You've okay. been very helpful. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you asked the wrong part. Okay. All right. But let me tell you my point to this, right? When we look at neurochemical imbalance, when someone has mental illness, right? We should never assume that it is any one thing that's causing that. Because there's something about neurochemical imbalance. It's a biological process. You and I have no control over that stuff. The chemicals in our brain, we see a lemon, 
immediately, you see that, sends it via the optic nerve to the good old brain, right, that sits at the top of your head, immediately you think sour, right? Well, you didn't choose to think sour, it just happens. Because the messages that are sent when you see something, you have no control about the chemicals that go back there to send it via the nerve, the per, uh, power, we call it the parasympathetic nervous system, right? Goes up here to the acena glands in your mouth. All of a sudden, the saliva rises. 70% of water exudes through the saliva glands, right? Then the enzymes show up. And then all of a sudden, you lick the lemon. Well, guess what? The messages showed up there way before you licked, right? It is just a science. Neurochemical imbalance, right? When you actually figure it out, it's not real, right? Not real. There is something that changes, right? It's, you, you, you now feel the lemon. You recognize it's not real. So it kind of down-regulate a little bit because now you have proof. It's really not a lemon after all. It just looks like a lemon. Such is anxiety. You see a little teddy bear in the window, but it looks like a big black bear. And you become afraid. Goes in the back, right? Many, many scientific stuff, right? And I'm not going to talk about anxiety, but this is just a matter of perception. It's not real, right? The lemon's hard as a rock. Looks like a lemon, and you're going to salivate. You couldn't stop that process because that's chemical. The very same chemical are in the brain. Dopamine serotonin, you have no control. We're beautifully and wonderfully made, by the way, right? We can't control that stuff. But what we do as providers and clinicians who prescribe medications, and today, by the way, you're going to talk to someone who actually can help to tweak those chemicals in the brain. You're going to hear from her shortly, by the way. Who can help to down-regulate some of these sens sensory, what we call stimuli? I'm not going to get scientific here, but we try to quiet those mouth-watering stuff that happens when you see the lemon, just so you become more understanding as to what's happening, okay? So there it goes. Abnormal functioning of nerve cell circuits or pathways that connect particular regions of the brain. That is all it is neurochemical imbalance. We identify these chemicals based on what you tell us, the way you're acting, the signs and symptoms, right? We figure out that this could be the chemical. So we tweak that medication, psychotherapy, right? We use all kinds of things. There are physicians who actually treat with electric stimulation, all kinds of things. That's not what we're doing here today. But I just wanted to give you an idea of what this word means, the neurochemical. We also know that mental illness occurs from physical disorders, like malfunctions in the brain, and malformations. In other words, you could be born with a defect and it just translates throughout the journey of your life. That is also a reason for mental illness. It's not just something you think you did. Disruption in the neuroendocrine system and the hormones that react to stimulate nerve cells. In a nutshell, your body is regulated by not just chemicals, hormones. Women can tell you, right? Guys do. There is testosterone, there is estrogen, there's progesterone, all kinds of hormones. We cannot even figure it out. So many, 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 many factors. So, hence, neurochemical imbalance, physical disorders, malformations of the brain, and hormones. Those contribute to mental illness. Next slide, please. So we just talked about biological, right? Here goes. 
psychological. I'm thinking the picture, you know, say something, right? Trauma. You're going to hear from someone who knows all about trauma and how to treat trauma by restructuring thought processes and who understands how the brain works and how the brain responds to that stuff. Abuse, emotional, physical, and sexual abu abuse. Loss, loss such, loss of a parent, loss of a spouse. Remember, poor mental health does not mean mental illness. If you believe, you know, I'm hoping that if you're experiencing loss does not mean you're mentally ill. It means that there's just something that has changed, okay? Grief. Neglect, poor ability to relate to others. These are some of the factors that we look at when we are trying to discern what is really going on. That is done through a careful assessment by a provider like myself, right? And a therapist who may ask you a number of questions. It is always important to conduct an initial assessment. You cannot treat what you don't know. Right? So it is important to talk to someone because so many times we self-diagnose. Not good. Environmental, death or divorce, a dysfunctional family life, feelings of inadequacy, low self-esteem, anxiety, anger, or loneliness. Did you know that when you change jobs or your kids change school, there is a mental impact on the brain. Mm -hmm. Social or cultural expectation. Body image issues. We talk about 18 to 25. Look at the commercials. Everyone's paper thin. Size one. Right? The pressures of society. Well, you can't model unless you lose weight. Well, I'm already 90 pounds, right? And your poor kid shows up wanting to lose more weight, right? Substance abuse. We have seen a rise in substance abuse since the COVID pandemic. The use of alcohol, legal substances, anything you can mix, open, blend, we see. Sometimes I don't even know what these substances are. Street drugs, heroin, all kinds of stuff, you know. Brothers and sisters, we might be very much protected from that here, but it's real. It's on the outside. It's in the community, right? No longer can we just shove it under the rug. We have a responsibility to teach and help and reach out to our community to help them. As a result of biological, psychological, and environmental stressors, or just the factors as they exist under each category, this is what the result is. Anxiety disorders show up. All kinds of mood disorders, psychotic disorders, eating disorders, personality disorders, and do not forget our dementia, right? And we talked about autism where we recognize that there are malformations, right, in the brain. We don't know all of it, but for what we know, we know that this is as a result of a dysregulatory, dysregulatory process of the brain, no matter what has caused it. And we as mental health providers are always very happy. I think we all show up to the table with a heart that just wants to understand and do something different. It's not easy being a mental health provider, by the way. It's a very stressful job, like most of medicine. But I think it attracts very special people. Not that I think I am one of them, but I do recognize that when you show up in this area of medicine, it requires a little bit more of a heart. Next slide. Okay, here we go. Mental health providers. Who, what, what do they do? We're gonna clear that up a little bit, right? There was something about a psychiatrist. Someone was like, you need to see a psychiatrist, right? It was so highly stigmatized. So psychiatrists ended up, no, nothing about this, but psychiatrists are usually older, right? Um, medical schools did not graduate many psychiatrists. 
right? You had all these residents who were medical, neuro, and all that good stuff. You hardly found anyone going into psychiatry. Hence, now, we don't have very many of them, okay? Not very many psychiatrists out there. And even if they are, they're retiring. It has now opened the door for folks like myself who have long started in psychiatry and decided to go into independent practice. Many states have allowed us now to practice independently, and that was not so before. We practice under a psychiatrist, as a nurse practitioner that is, we practice under a psychiatrist who would, what we call collaborate with us, right? So we had to, not permission, but you know, you had to work alongside a psychiatrist. With our level of training and our expertise that we bring to the table, Florida has now allowed us as nurse practitioners to practice independently in the area of psychiatry. And I have benefited from that change in the law. We have psychiatrists, what do they do? They prescribe medication, they diagnose, they assess, they treat, they monitor your response to the medication, and they're medical doctors, right? So they went to medical school, all that stuff, and they became, right, a psychiatrist. They went into that uh, area of study. They also specialize in different kinds of electrical stimulation treatment or geriatrics or adult, they, right? They pick a specialty. So there are times when you see a psychiatrist and it might be what we call a geriatric psychiatrist or might be an adolescent young people's psychiatrist. You can align all kinds of different area of your, you know, your whatever you want to practice with your role as a medical doctor, right? So that is who a psychiatrist is. A psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner is the same. We do the same thing. We order labs, we prescribe medication. Well, because I am a nurse, I do nurse stuff too, right? Psychiatrists do not do nurse stuff. I do nurse stuff because I'm already a nurse and a psychiatrist combined. Then we have the psychologist, right? They do not prescribe medication, but they assess, they diagnose, and they, right, they do quite a bit of the talk, they conduct tests. There is such a thing as a neuropsychological test that I sent all my clients who I believe has some issues with, like for example, autism, right? I wanna understand some things that I may not you know, have learned. So I do send them to psychologists. We have the therapists, the counselors, and clinical social workers. And you know what? We are blessed to have clinical social workers among us in this congregation. Right? So, and we do have a number of expertise and folks who work in mental health right here in the Apopka Church. But therapists, counselors, clinical social workers, they are phenomenal people. They listen, they assess, they also do something which is amazing. They connect you to community resources they know where to find the stuff. Sometimes it's all you need to get back to a good place. You need to be connected to stuff that can help you so you don't have to take a pill, so you don't have to have sleepless nights, so you don't have to worry so much. You should never be afraid to see a therapist. You should never be afraid to see a counselor. It's just a talk. There's no pill involved. I know you stay away, men, not you, but I'm just saying, many folks stay away from these providers because of fear. False evidence appearing real, like the lemon. It's not real. Just take a chance, just talk. And I also know many folks don't want to talk to people they know. They'd rather just just a little personal story. When I was younger and I just had my kids, I would try to figure out who are the doctors, the dentists, the OBGYNs. I want to know who my kids are playing with and where can I see one of those doctors in the soccer field? Where do they go to the supermarket? Because I've been showing up, dentist is there, I'm like, I have a tooth problem here. 
I'm like, no, gotta come see me. I'm like, not too bad. Just think orange gel will work, you know? I'm always looking for some free advice, right? Most people don't wanna see their doctor in the supermarket. I loved it because at least I get like a little prep before I go in. Don't have insurance, but guess what? My son plays with a mom or dad who's a doctor. I'm gonna be showing up at that soccer field every Sunday. So I'm like, hey, you know, I have a little backache last week and it's not going away. What do you think? Right? Okay with that. Most people don't want to see people they know. I never cared and I still don't. I mean, if I know there's a doctor around here who goes to Walmart neighborhood or Sprouts Market, I'm going to be there every Sunday because I know you're going to be showing up. I'm going to ask you about my back or my teeth, right? I want you to be very comfortable having conversations. It will prevent decline. Because sometimes we wait too long before things go south, before we reach out. That's who these folks are. Next slide, please. The National Suicide and Crisis Hotline is a resource for you. I'm not going to go into the statistics about suicide, but just be aware. It is among us, even in the church. Emergency medical services is also that number that will always, always be there for you. 988, you will not be on hold. They're not going to ask you too many questions. You won't be transferred from this desk to that desk. No, it's there for you. It was recently changed. It is a helpline. Because you're a Christian does not mean you will never call the National Suicide Hotline. This affects all of us. I am going to invite Bonnie Rosso to come and talk to you about what she does as a therapist. Can you just put your hand together for Bonnie? Thank you so much for coming from all the way I don't know if that works. Let's see. From Port St. Lucie. From Port St. Lucie. Yes. Thank you for having me, and it's wonderful to be here with you folks. Thank you so much. Julia covered a lot. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about me and where I come from and why I do what I do. So I am um, a transplant from California. I grew up in Los Angeles. Um, I moved to Florida three years ago, and it's been a complete culture shock. Um, but uh, the universe found it fit for me to be here and I am, I'm loving it. I'm making wonderful connections and um, life, is, life is flourishing. It's good. I'm, I'm blessed to have this opportunity, so thank you. So I, um, I went to graduate school at USC and from USC I went into uh, my very first uh, internship was in domestic violence safe house. The moms in there had to have substance abuse also, so they, were, they had a double whammy there. They were on lockdown, they were in fear, and that's where my career started. So I have been um, exposed to so many different uh, challenges that people faced, generational trauma, right, things that parents did because their parents did, and that's what they do because that's what they know. And so, um, breaking that generational trauma, you know, giving people more information so that they can do better for their kids, so that they can do better for their kids. This is the growth that we see in relationships. And really when it comes down to therapy for me, it's I want to have that therapeutic relationship with the person on the other side. Um, so I uh, started, I, I got uh, after graduate school, I went uh, inpatient on the inpatient unit at UCLA Hospital because I wanted to be able to diagnose. I wanted to know what it looks like. What does it sound like? How long do these, you know, how long does somebody with a bipolar episode, what does that look like? So that I could better speak to it, so that I could better help treat. Um, and what I found was I really should have gone to med school because all I wanted to do was hang out with Dr. Augustinus with all the med students, and he would just let me tag along. And let me tell you, after two years of interning, I went into my clinical exam and I just 
I knocked it out of the park. And it's a very difficult exam. So it's been eight years up to this point um, of education. So I should have gone to med school, I really do. But I have it in my heart and I love working with psychiatrists. So when Juliet reached out and she said, you know, let's see if we can work together, I was all for it. So I, um, when I came to uh, Florida here, I too like, you know, non I'm in nonprofits. Um, and I started from scratch at a community health center in a very, um, it was a very challenged neighborhood, and I was definitely the minority in that neighborhood. So um, for me, I had to build relationships so that people trusted me. And I built from scratch, a, um, we were in 12, 12 health centers, five counties. We were rolling mental health out in places that they didn't have it. So I love it. I love it. I love overcoming barriers that people have. And like Juliet said, you know, we can see people that we couldn't see, right? We can reach out to those people who can't get a ride to their therapist, who have agoraphobia and are afraid to go outside. We can reach those people. And that was really evident during COVID. Um, during COVID, when there was a lockdown, I still had to go to work every day every day and I changed the practice from you're coming into the office to you're logging into that screen. And let me tell you, at one point I had 96 clients and it is not easy to teach 70 and 80 year olds to log in, but we did it, right? We did it, we did it and they loved it. And people came and people told people in these communities where I didn't even speak the language sometimes. I was doing therapy with Haitian women and she came, I had to get a translator, but we worked it out. We worked through those barriers. I would grab the doctor, doctor come in here, sit with me and talk, you know, and we worked it out because that's what we have. And that's the social worker in me, you know? We, we find resources where you feel like there aren't none, and aren't none, where there aren't any. <laughs> you know? um, but uh, COVID was very taxing. Like you said, it's difficult to be a mental health person. I had 96 clients and 25 on a wait list. There, and it was, you can only imagine what I heard on that screen. My husband's dead. My son has passed. You know, my daughter's relapsed. We don't know where she is. It was just death after death and loss and loss and loss. And that was taxing, you know, that was very taxing on me. So I decided to make a change. And um, now I am, I'm a clinical director at a community mental health center where I can better uh, mentor social workers, but I also have about 500 kids and 100 adults that we manage. But what I miss is this. I miss that session. I miss the, the clients coming in. So I too started a private practice recently and um, I'm very, very excited about it because this is, this is my work. I use a lot of different modalities. Um, we call it CBT. You broke it down very simply, right? How our thoughts and our feelings and our actions, right? And sometimes we don't think about, you know, something triggers us, we react, and then we go, well, why, why'd that happen? And so a therapist can just very simply break these things down and break these cycles that keep you going on a hamster wheel. You know, sometimes the therapist can just help you just step off the wheel, right? Um, and then when you're making changes, you will see the people around you change. It's amazing, especially in family systems. So um, what else? I also have a specialty in what's called accelerated resolution therapy. Sounds like a whole bunch of mumbo jumbo. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of EMDR, but it's like EMDR on steroids. So it's evidence-based, so that means it's scientifically proven effective. Um, the VA administration is using it on combat veterans. What's phenomenal about this is if you're somebody that you have that thing deep down that keeps you sick, that seek, that something, something that happened you know, in the, the Gulf War or whatever that you can't talk about, you don't have to and you still get the effects. It uses eye movements and it reprocesses the negative sensations and emotion that your body feels that's attached to that memory that's way back there that you don't even know is there, right? So sometimes we have these fears that come up, we don't know where they came from. So they show up and they show up as anxiety, depression, 
all sorts of things. And then that leads into health. So what if I told you that with between one and five, that's the average, one in five sessions, it can treat anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, that's no pill. Not that there's anything wrong with a pill because the science has proven that with therapy and psychiatry, the outcome is much higher. But what I love, about, let me, quick story. I had a, a major car accident. I was ejected out of a car window. I flew, the, a spectator said, there's no way she's alive, no way. She was tumbling like a gymnast in the road. Um, I had very bad PTSD, even after all the therapy, everything. You put me in a car, I was, I was tense, I couldn't look down, I had the thing like this, it was terrible. It was terrible. I went to this accelerated resolution therapy training and I went with another psych nurse practitioner friend and she did one session on me, one session. And we were driving around after the training and I'm digging around in my purse and she's like, Bonnie, how are you feeling right now? And I'm like, what are you talking about? Gone, 10 years, 10 years of trauma in one hour, gone. So with that, I am an advocate for it. I love it. And I can do it through the computer. You don't have to come outside. You could just log in. We talk the first session about what you want to talk about. And with art, the great thing is you could talk about as much as you want, or you can talk, you don't have to share at all. It's phenomenal. If you, I just encourage you, go on YouTube and look up Accelerated Resolution Therapy. It's it's simple and it's effective and it's, it gets to the root. You know, we put a lot of band-aids on things, you know, but it gets to that root of that trauma and we pull that root out so that when you are exposed to whatever it causes you, anxiety or depression, you know, that big scary thing that isn't really scary, we minimize those symptoms. It's phenomenal. Um, so I am a licensed clinical social worker, um, so I'm a psychotherapist also, but I do have that case management experience, you know, linking folks to um, resources in their community, helping people navigate systems that are very difficult. These systems are difficult even for me, and I've been doing this for 15 years, but I'm scrappy, and I can find it. If it's not out there, I know where to find it, and I can teach you to find it for yourself also. That's the thing. But sometimes it's very difficult, and it's nice to have somebody that knows how to navigate systems if you have barriers to, who knows, a lot of things. A lot of people come to therapy for all different reasons. You know, and the therapist just meets you where you are. You know, you come for what you need. You know, if you need to call, come and talk about your boss, you come and talk about your boss. If you lost your dog, which is terrible, please come and talk about your dog, because that is grief and loss and hurt just the same as somebody that lost somebody close to them. So it really depends on what your goals and what you wanna see for yourself happen. I mean, the benefits of therapy are unlimited. I recommend it for everybody. Um, and I think that's it, yeah. Thank you, yes. Thank you, Julia. Yes. Thank you so much, yeah. Wonderful. Okay. There you go. You just heard from, see why, see what I meant? Such diversity in this area of mental health. Next slide, please. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Appreciate it. Okay, with all that we have just heard and understood, where do we go from here? I go right back to TCI, to attain wellness and optimized function. That is our goal here at the Apopka Church. We intend to embark on programs here in this church to help to facilitate just that. Here I am, Lord, send me. Our goal is to attain wellness and optimize function, and that should be a personal goal for each one of us. But how do you get there? Bonnie just explained the fact that there is help. If you can tap into the right resources, the right time, the right people, despite how private you may be, despite how reluctant you have been, because mental health was never that conversation, right? 
Healthy coping skills, right? You could learn healthy coping skills, right? Reestablish good social connections. COVID has really disrupted that. Restorative sleep. Hmm. That's a problem, right? Such stimulation in our society today, the phone, the bed, everyone. There is so much competing for time and attention that sleep has now been not good. Safe of medication, right? That should be a goal. Use medication safely. There's nothing wrong with medication. Using them safely, right? Understanding what you're taking, for what reason. Is there any way we could look at lifestyle change, right? No substance use. Exercise. Healthy dietary habits. Healthy friendships. That should be a personal goal for all of us. Really help to attain wellness and optimize function. Next slide, please. Positive ways um, to maintain your mental health. Well, first, get professional help. You know, we recommend to not ever self-diagnose. And I tend to say to folks, this because I'm a mental health provider and I'm, you know, I know stuff, I will never talk to you and try to diagnose you. That's not what I do, okay? Don't have to be afraid to say, hey, Bridget, hey, you know, feel some kind of way. Like, I'm not here to diagnose, right? I would need a lot of information to diagnose anything, right? So get professional help. Yeah, not someone in the supermarket. Hey, I know you're a doctor. You come to my church. Hey, what do you think about this tooth? Right? That's what I did, right? Get professional help. Talk to a therapist. Talk to a psychiatrist. Talk to me. I'm a psych nurse practitioner. Talk to a counselor. Talk to a psychologist. Talk to your social worker. Just talk to somebody. Stay positive. There's something about the brain and positivity. Did you know that 85% of the thoughts are negative? means you have to be very intentional to be positive. Get enough sleep. Sleep is anchoring. There's a reason why we sleep, right? It's a biological process. You must sleep and get enough sleep. Develop positive coping skills and getting physical activity, right? You gotta exercise, gonna move around a little bit, right? Next slide, please. Plan programs right here. See, we're building a beautiful church. We've got to do stuff, right? Services, not programs, services, right? We're going to have individual consultations. I am always going to be front and center in that because I believe that if I have a great team, like all the social workers in the church, and Bonnie, and myself, and my friends who are psychiatrists, and nurse practitioners, and we have nurses here who are also learning new things and we become a part of the great health ministry which is going to happen here again right we're going to resurrect that health ministry something happened today and someone needed help and we didn't know where to turn that should never happen again not under our watch as nurses and health professionals in this congregation we're going to do stress management classes i did that for six weeks last year we're going to do it again. Group sessions. That's a goal. Maynard told me about great plans that we have for 2023. I'm very excited. Addiction support. All kinds of things. Pornography. Rampant in our society. Folks, may not be happening on your, here, but it's, it's here. It's out there. Talk therapy. There was a great program recently where we had a little something downstairs. Let's chat. It was so nice just to come together and just talk. Your mental health matters. You matter. Next slide, please. I am going to pass out. Or actually, I'm going to just leave at the back some forms that you could consider filling out, you know, whether you would like to participate in programs in the church, whether you'd like an individual consultation with myself, or if you want a referral to someone else, I could do that too, right? But I am available. I am offering myself. I am going to leave them around, or if you would just like one, you can pick one from the chair or whatever. Um, you can complete them. And you can also hand them to me or their sister Angela, right? Or you can give that to, I'm sorry, Maynard, you want to say something? Oh, absolutely. Yes, thank you so much. Yep. You can just complete them. By the way, your name is optional. You don't even put your name. Just tell me where I can email or where I can call. I hope that this was helpful for you. And I really thank you for coming.
I just want to thank uh, Juliet and Bonnie for coming. This is awesome, and uh, we're kicking around some ideas for 2023, and we'd like to have your feedback because 2023 is going to be on us real soon. The current initiative for TCI runs through November of this year, formally. We're hoping that informally it will continue specifically in some of the areas in terms of our shut-ins, our seniors, and so forth for uh, into December because over the holidays is when some of the shut-ins and the seniors need us. They need our support. They need our encouragement. And so I hope that they will, that will continue through the holiday season. But I, I've sent out some some ideas to the pastors, and I've included the two or three here in this room, in terms of 2023, January. And <clears throat> we're looking at focusing on health. As, as we think about people around us, people are hurting. There are a lot of people who have stress, who have different illnesses, I'm the one who receives the prayer uh, line cards that come through and, and look at, and I do not send out all of the information that comes in on those cards sometimes because of privacy. And there are certain uh, information that comes in. People in this church are hurting and they're reaching out. And so give us some thought, give me your feedback in terms of starting in January, uh, a strong emphasis because we have in our community at large, in Apocra, people who are hurting, people who are hurting. So let's have uh, a word of prayer, but be, do not leave after that because we have some uh, goodies, some veggies, and some watermelon. So uh, we'd like for you to to uh, come and partake of that. So let's have a word of prayer to close out and then you can visit with uh, the folks here with Bonnie and with uh, uh, Juliet, uh, so forth. Our Father in heaven, we just thank you so much for building our bodies to be healthy. You designed us to be healthy and well and we want to treat our bodies as your temple. And so we thank you for the knowledge, the information that's been provided today. As we go forth, may we not be afraid to speak out or to seek the resources that we need to seek, but may we be open to your leading and your guidance. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for coming. Please, uh, we got some, uh, some good things there, so uh, come and uh, have some veggies.